Contend for the faith. Contend for the faith. So just a quick um, little recap. You know, as we talk about contending, we're always considering the fact that a line is drawn. There are persons on either side of it, and there will be some conflict. Okay, whenever you contend for something, that's just what it means. Um, you're going to contend in your workplace. You're going to contend in your families, in your marriage. Um, it's just the way that it is. And we also mentioned that contending or conflict doesn't always mean it's the worst case scenario. It's just a part of life. But it always means that there's a bit of opposition. And so as a Jude is helping us understand, uh, we have to contend for the faith. Jude's greatest concern is the state of the church and the impact that false teachers and apostates are having in the church. So that's his heart as he writes this. Um, as we reflected in, in Matthew, Jesus, even before the church was actually instituted, sort of as we know it, he says, beware the false prophets. They're going to come. They're here. And then Jude goes further to really explain the fact that, one, they're here, and now we can't just be on the sidelines sort of saying, well, I hope it goes away. It's not going to go away, so we have to contend for the faith. And so that's Jude's heart. We reflected a little bit even as we looked in Revelation. Um, last week, I think I said Revelation 1 in regards to those seven churches is actually Revelation chapter 2. But in any case, those were seven churches that Jesus Christ uh, re revealed a report card to John who wrote it down for us to know what it was. And of those seven churches, by the time John wrote that book, five of them had already been compromised because of false doctrine. They were grasping some stuff. They were letting some stuff slip in and leak in. And at the end of it all, five of those churches got a bad report. Only two of them got a good report. And then if we fast forward to sort of where we are now, none of those seven churches, which were real physical churches, none of them exist. None of them exist at all. And they would have traditionally been in the area uh, in Turkey, um, and that is a very strong Muslim um, stronghold today. So none of those seven churches are still there. And a lot of it was because false doctrines were tolerated. They crept in. Maybe they didn't know God's word, they didn't know how to contend, they didn't know they had to contend, but at the end of the day, those churches do not remain. And so on Jude's heart is, we got to contend for the faith. we got to contend for the faith. So this is sort of our theme verse as we've been looking at it, Jude chapter 1, verse 3. He says, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that the Lord has once for all entrusted to us his people. And so we talked about this a little bit, and it sort of seems to imply that Jude initially had a lot of other things on his mind that he wanted to share with this church, but the Holy Spirit was just saying, Jude, maybe that's another volume. That's good stuff, but right now you have to encourage them and urge them to contend for the faith. So everything that Jude sort of had in his mind that he was going to share sort of had to take a second seat because the most important thing was for them to contend for the faith. Another way we sort of looked at this is the idea of gladiators, sort of being in conflict. It's going to be required. Um, contending as a church, another thing we talked about, uh, some of the letters you find in the New Testament are written specifically to a pastor like Timothy or Titus or something like that. Uh, Jude, he doesn't label anybody. It's a letter to the whole church. Everyone's included. Everyone who names the name of Jesus in Jude's mind as he's teaching this, you have to get involved. And so this is the picture of what it looks like. All of us have to get involved in this. We have to learn to contend for the faith. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to do five years of seminary or read the Bible ten times. All of that's good. But to contend for the faith, be confident in the testimony that you have, that God has changed your life. Yes, we do need to study God's Word so that we can engage uh, in the right way in conversations with persons. But contending for the faith is something you and I have to do. We're all going to be in a different starting place, so there's not one sort of thing, but we all have to do it. We gotta spend time in God's word. We gotta ask God for boldness. We gotta um, be able to tell our testimony, even though it might be a personal one. All of those things are ways in which we contend for the faith. And for some, God blesses with maybe a little different intellect per se, and maybe they can scrub into some deeper things and get involved in different ways. But each of us has a role to play when it comes to contending for the faith. So don't think that if it doesn't look like uh, Ravi Zachariah, you can't do it. If that was the case, nobody could do it. But Every single one of us has, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit of God, and God is instructing, imploring us that we have to engage in this battle. Now, while we 
understand that that's true, we have to understand something else as well, and that's this. The battle that we fight, oftentimes it is initially engaged with people because people are the ones that we come into contact with. Those are the ones that sometimes have doctrine or things that aren't aligned with scripture. And so in a sense, they're the first person that we might meet when it comes to contending for the faith. But never forget this. The real battle is not against the people that you meet. That's not where the battle is. The real battle, as Paul describes it, is against the principalities. In Ephesians 6, verse 12, uh, this is Paul writing, he says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This is who the battle is against. And so when it comes to this thing that Judas is addressing of false teachers and apostates, these persons are instruments in Satan's hands. The battle is against Satan. It always will be. But sometimes, unfortunately, and even we can be deceived sometimes, we can become instruments in the devil's hands to do his work. So we have to be careful. We have to engage with people. We have to be honest. We have to study. We've got to do all of those things. But as we're doing that, always remember that the battle is actually against the devil, his principalities, the demonic forces that sometimes use people as instruments to come against God's truth that impacts on us and it potentially can impact on our church. Amen? Got to understand that. All right. So, content for the faith. We're going to jump right in. We're going to be looking at verses 8 to 16 today. How many of you read through Jude this week? All right. I see some hands going up. That's great. Never get comfortable just reading something once or twice. Just keep going over it. I just want to encourage you with that. All right. God always has something new to reveal to you. And even though Jude is a very short Chapter, we can sometimes come to the conclusion that there's nothing new in it, but keep reading it, okay? And that applies to all of Scripture. Keep reading it. Last week, we looked um, a bit more about, you know, the personal responsibilities that we have to contend for the faith. And so one of the examples that Jude was bringing about was um, sometimes, you know, even as, as this church that he was writing to and even us, we can come to the conclusion that, you know what, there's false uh, apostates, they do deserve to be judged. After all, they're doing the wrong thing, or that person should definitely be judged. And, but what Jude was bringing about by using three examples, which was the first, the apostate Israelites of old, or God's special people from old, and then the next was angels who had crossed some boundaries that God put in place, and then the last was Sodom and Gomorrah and the boundaries that they crossed that God put in place. And the implication that Jude was wanting us to understand is if God's people of old didn't get a pass and they were judged when they crossed God's line and they became apostate and they were deceiving and impacting on other people, if the angels crossed the boundaries that God put in place that they knew, and if Sodom and Gomorrah as wicked Gentiles still, you know, not maybe knowing God or what have you, but again, God says, enough of me is revealed for everyone to know that I exist. If God didn't give any of those people a pass, do you think we'll get a pass if we decide to walk away? And the answer is no. So God always judges the perversions and those apostates or those persons or whatever it is that comes against the standard that he has already set. And so that's the personal thing that we have to come to grips with. We can't just say, oh, well, that person, yes, they should be judged. Or that God wants us all to appreciate whenever we receive truth and determine that we're going to walk away from it, there's a judgment that comes. doesn't matter who you are. God is not a, 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 a you know, it, it doesn't matter who you are. That's just a finite decree that God has already put in place. So don't just always think, well, that person, that person, this is for us as well. Don't walk away from God's truth. Walk away from a church that doesn't preach God's truth, but never walk away from God's truth, because there's always consequences when we do that. So we're going to pick up in verse 8. We're going to read through, and then we'll come back and make some notes. So here, Jude is picking back up on the characteristics of the false teachers and the apostates. And in the 25 verses, again, a short chapter, he spend so much time going through the characteristics of these false teachers for one reason. He wants that church and us to understand what the fruit looks like so we can recognize it. Because again, we looked at, I think it was verse 6, where the idea is that they slipped in. So it wasn't obvious. 
It wasn't obvious. So by their fruits, Jesus said you'll know them, and Jude is expanding on that by ensuring that we understand what the fruits look like so we can run like crazy when we come into contact with the false teacher or an apostate. So Jude 1.8 says this, In the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Yet these people speak abusively against whatever they do not understand, and what things they do understand by instinct, like unreasoning animals, these are the very things that destroy them. Woe to them, they have taken the way of Cain and have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. These people are blemishes at your love feast, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts they have done in an ungodly way and of all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These people are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others with their own advantage, for their own advantage. So that's verses 8 through 16. So let's look at verse 8. In the very same way, in the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. The idea on the strength of their dreams, Jude is bringing about an understanding that these guys are dreamers. So in a sense, they, 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 they have their minds so set up on a selfish attitude and something that only... Uh, is benefit to them, that they even sway themselves to think that it's God who actually told them what they're hearing, but they're really making it up, and they're unreliable people. They're dreamers. Now, we live in a world today where a lot of times you might hear a prophecy, and someone has a word for you, and this way, that way, and I'm not here to judge people. I'm just going to tell you what God's word says. But you have to be careful. People may come to you and say, I have a word from the Lord. Or, I woke up and this was on my heart, and I know this is for you. You have to be careful. This is what uh, we find in uh, the Old Testament in Deuteronomy. Write this down, Deuteronomy chapter 13, okay? Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1 to 3. This is what it says. It says, if a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a sign or a wonder, and if the sign or wonder spoken of takes place, and the prophet says, let us follow other gods, gods you have not known, and let us worship them. You must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. In other words, what is going on there is that you might come across a person who might say, I have a word. I've heard something. I've learned something. I've dreamt something. I've come up with something, and it's for you. And it might even come true. It might even come true. But in that, there's another part of what they might be saying or what they might be encouraging to do, which is trying to lead you away from the truth of who God is and what God wants you to do. And so what Moses, who wrote Deuteronomy, is saying there is, even in that situation, you got to reject what they're saying. Because they say something that comes true is not an indicator that they are absolutely speaking on God's behalf. So you have to be careful. And this is the difficult sort of scenario to come to grips with because what oftentimes happens is once something comes true that someone says will come true, we start to get bent over to this way without really investigating what other things might be, we, they might be trying to pull us away from when it comes to God's truth. And the Bible is very clear there. It says God is testing you to see whether or not you're going to hold to what it is that I want you to do and show your love for me or are you going to run with the thing that tickles your ear and makes it sound good and say, yeah, that person was right? Sometimes people will get it right. But that doesn't mean that that's from God. 
And that's the idea with these apostates that Jude is referring to. This word dreamer is the same idea. It's the idea of, well, I come up with something and it sounds good. It might come true in your life. But that cannot be the litmus test on whether or not somebody is true or not. You have to look at the whole thing. Maybe you listen to what they say. I get that. But then you have to evaluate all the rest of the stuff. Are they trying to pull me away from something I know God already has established for me to do? God says, if persons like that come about, say something, and it comes true, don't automatically run with it. You have to still rely on God's discernment to say, God, is this of you? Is anything else being violated? Because, I'm, again, I'm not going to suggest that they're all false if somebody does say something, but what the Bible is teaching us here is don't just run with it. It could be a test that God is allowing to determine where your heart really is. And that is the idea that Jude is pulling about when it comes to those um, false prophets with their dreams. It goes on to say, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies. One of the characteristics of false prophets, apostates, false teachers, it's just the way it is. There is immorality associated with it. Somewhere in there. That's just the way that it is. And all through this, up until verse 8, you find Judas trying to make sure people know that. It's like, well, if we spoke a good word, okay, that's great, but what's their life like? They preach well, yeah, okay, but what's their life like? And one of the characteristics that false teachers have is immorality. It's just the way that it is. It's one of those things. They have never come to really receive God's grace and God's power in their lives to deal with the lust that they have, and so it usually shows up. That's what Jude is teaching here for us to understand who it is we should follow, who are really representing God, who are out for their own agenda, and how it is that we should be aligned. The next thing he says is this, they reject authority. Most, not most, this is God's word. This is what Jude says. Jude says they reject authority. They have a hard time coming on the authority of anybody because they are their own authorities. So when you maybe find somebody that doesn't, seem as if they need to be accountable to anybody, but they're preaching right, and they might be speaking a word that is coming true and all of that stuff. Again, you have to look at it based on what God says the criteria is. Jude is saying, clearly, these are persons who they reject authority. They reject authority. They don't like coming under authority. And when they do that, they don't come under Christ's authority. So they are their own authority uh, for themselves. And then it says they heap abuse on celestial beings. Interesting term there. Um, yeah, celestial beings, talking about the angels, the spirit world. And it seems to imply that these persons, since they haven't put themselves under Christ's authority, they haven't respected the boundaries that God wants them to respect as it relates to the other created beings that God created. And so they see themselves on the level of every other created being and just talk flippantly about them. Now, the next verse sort of bears this out, and this is something that I want us to appreciate too because we have to be very careful with what we say based on what God's word is teaching us. And this is what it says in verse 9. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Now, you'll find um, references to Satan's fall and his character before he became Satan in Isaiah and Ezekiel and Revelation and Luke as well. But this is very interesting because Satan is described as the highest angel prior to his fall, okay? He, it seems to imply that worship is such a tangible thing and prayer is such a tangible thing. We understand that from revelations that God actually bottles up our prayers. He keeps them, puts them in these vials, and, and it's an awesome thing. So it's, it's, I know for us sometimes prayer and worship seems a bit intangible, but in the spirit realm, it's tangible. It's like a thing. It's stuff. It's a substance. And it seems to imply that one of Satan's rules was to actually gather the worship and these tangible substances in the throne room and then present it to God. That seems to imply what Satan's rule was before he decided that I want to be like God, I don't want to be under anyone's rule, and then he was kicked out of heaven. But now, even in his fallen state, he is Satan. He's no longer Lucifer. He's no longer on God's side. He's in rebellion, and he's been cast out of heaven. Even in this state... The archangel Michael, who is God's top angel over his host, Michael didn't dare, even in this instance, even in Satan's rebellious state, 
he didn't dare say, I rebuke you, Satan, or who do you think you are, or even this or that. He said simply, the Lord rebuke you. The archangel Michael understood the boundaries. He understood the way in which God created what he created. And even though he was now the top angel, he understood that Satan was accountable to one person, and it wasn't him. So the idea of, 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 of these apostates and, and false teachers as they seek to be flippant with, 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 with language as it relates to maybe the devil or other angels or whatever and putting themselves on a level, not even Michael did that. And that's the idea. It's this irreverence that comes about from these false teachers. It might look like confidence, but it's actually irreverence. Not even Michael. Even though Satan is in his fallen state, did he once slander him and say, Satan, get out of here, or this, that, the other? He said, no, I don't have authority over you like that. You're accountable to God. So you know what? The Lord rebuke you. So it's a very interesting scenario that Jude is bringing about as it relates to the heart and of irreverence in these apostates. As we go on, all right, verse 10 thinking of the same idea. Yet these people speak abusively, these false prophets, against whatever they do not understand. They don't understand because they never have come under the authority of Christ. It may look like it, but they haven't. And so they never understood how it is that to relate to the other creative beings that God has put in place. And so they just speak flippantly or abusively or as if they are on par with Michael the archangel or other things. No, for you and I, we have to be very careful how we say what we say. When it comes to the devil, he's real. He has some power. He exercises that. He gets all up in your life and in your business, and he tries to destroy some stuff. And yes, the blood of Christ is the thing that covers us and makes us right with God, giving us access to the throne room and giving us access to everything God wants us to have. But it's not you and I that war with the devil like we have anything in us. It's God. And so when those scenarios happen, when God, when the devil is showing up or this, we have to be very careful, just like Mark Michael said, God, I need you to rebuke the devil, or God, because that's the name that the devil recognizes. He doesn't recognize your name and my name. You kidding me? He's responsible to God. And so we have to understand that, and we have to have that disposition, and we have to speak as such. But this is one of the traits that Judas is bringing about as it pertains to false teachers. They feel as if they're on the par with all of the other created beings, and there are no boundaries that they can cross, okay? Don't know from there. And what things they do understand by instinct, like reasoning animals, they are the very things that destroy them. And again, it's just really illustrating the fact that they operate based on their feelings. I dreamt this up last night. This is what I really want to do. God might be saying this, but this is what I really want to do. And so it's by instinct. It's by their feelings. That's how animals do it. They just sort of go about by feelings. They haven't thought through the whole scenario. And this is what Jude is bringing about. These false teachers, they operate by their feelings. They operate by their feelings. And these are the things that um, very often destroy them. The next thing Jude goes on to do is compare these apostates to apostates from the past. Okay, you always find you doing that. And the first is this what he said. He says, Woe to them. They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. And the first thing he says there is, Woe to them. This is the word you'll find Jesus saying this. Um, it, it's, it's a strong word that says, Whoa, you guys are in so much trouble and you don't even realize it. Woe to them. It's a judgment that says, You know, you guys, it's going to be bad for you and you don't even realize it. Woe to you. And then he goes on to illustrate these three examples of apostates in the past that he compares the apostates to. And the first is they have taken the way of Cain. They have taken the way of Cain. Now, everyone, I would imagine, knows the story of Cain. Cain was the first person in the history of the world to be born into sin. Adam and Eve, they were not born into sin. God made them perfectly. Sin entered them as they rebelled against God. Cain is the first person in the history of the world that was born into sin. He was the firstborn of Adam and Eve. Abel was the secondborn of Adam and Eve. So Cain is, in a sense, the, 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 the model, if you were, for those of us and everybody who will turn away from God's truth, those who have been born into sin. That's the idea of Cain. Now, if you know the story of Cain, uh, Genesis 6, you should read through that. But in a real nutshell, 
so Cain was a farmer. He loved to farm. I'm sure he had some great vegetables and all the rest of it. And Abel, he had flocks. And on one day, uh, maybe it was the first time, but it was time to go before God and to present their sacrifices. So Cain goes first. Cain brings the best of his stuff. God rejects his sacrifice. Abel brings the best of his stuff, which was livestock. God accepted it. Cain was vexed. Okay? To the extent that one day later, or maybe even the same day, or at a later time, Cain gets so angry he kills Abel. Kills him. So a couple things to take away from there. Read the story. Read the account for yourself. But a couple things to take away from there. For the mere fact that God rejected Cain's sacrifice means that Cain knew what the sacrifice should have been. God is not a God who's just going to pull a trump card and say, oh, well, this is what you get. Cain had to have known it. And in fact, I'm sure the story of Adam and Eve telling Cain what happened even when they um, took of that fruit and rebelled up against God, the first thing that happened in order to cover sin was that an animal had to die. The Bible says that God clothed Adam and Eve in skin, so an animal had to die. So the pattern was already set. So here comes Cain. I guess he loved farming and all the rest of it. And he determined that, you know what? I understand what you want, but I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to bring you the best of what I have, and I'm going to expect that you're going to accept it because, after all, that's what I want to give you. Jude is saying that these apostates, they're following in the same mindset and a heart condition, which is they might be very religious, but they're very disobedient. Very religious. So I'm sure Cain knew the time that the sacrifice was necessary. He probably knew all of the details and all the rest of it. And he probably still went to that place in an arrogant way. So religiousness wasn't the problem. Disobedience was. And that is one of the things that these apostates have as a heart condition. Might be religious, but they're disobedient. Because God has said, well, that sounds good, but I prefer to do so that's one of the things. The second thing that he brings about there is they have rushed for profit into Balaam's era. Again, you've got to read this. This is in the Old Testament, Numbers 22 to 24. Numbers 22 to 24. So write that down and go check that out as well. But the era of Balaam um, was simply prophecy for hire. Guys getting into the business to get money. So this whole idea of prosperity gospel and all of that is nothing new. It's nothing new. This was going on in the Old Testament, and a real quick summary of it is this guy named Balak, he was the king of Moab, and the Israelites were sort of boundering on his property, and it, they were big, and he was afraid of them, and he wanted to get rid of them. So in order to get rid of them, he hires this guy, Balaam, who was a false prophet, looked good, he got some things right at times, but he hired them, hired him to curse the Israelites because he wanted to get rid of them, okay? Now God intervenes in some creative ways between an angel and a donkey that was talking to Balaam. God stops it in his track. It didn't happen. But what Jude is bringing about here is the heart behind why this guy got into the ministry business was he wanted some money. So he was a prophet for hire. And this is another trait that the apostates have. Okay? I was going to say you could look here, there, or anywhere, but you know what I mean. I'm not trying to point fingers, but you'll see it. And this is the idea that Jude wants us to understand. When you see it, this is what it is. Don't think about it. Maybe they did get one thing right when they prophesied last week. But all of this stuff, you can't ignore it. That's what Jude wants us to understand. This whole thing about wanting to get money from ministry is nothing new. And this is the trait of the apostates. That's what Jude says here. The last thing, the last example that he uses there, they have been destroyed in chorus rebellion. In chorus rebellion. God, again, you got to read this. Numbers chapter 16. That's where the event is. Numbers chapter 16. Uh, Korah. Now, Korah was a Levite. He was a cousin of Moses. Okay? And one thing about the Levites, they had a unique task, and it's really interesting how they got that task, but that's another story. But God had given them this special opportunity to serve in the tabernacle, from taking care of the things, packing it up, moving it, all of that stuff. It was a, it was a, it was a tremendous, awesome opportunity. Every Israelite didn't get to do that, but the Levites did. So Korah was Moses' cousin. He was a Levite, and he had a very important job to do as the others did in the tabernacle. But 
he determined that, you know what, this is nice to know, but I want to be a priest. The priest also came from the Levites, but there was a line that God determined that some would be priests, some would work in the tabernacle. So Korah wanted not just to do what God called him to do, but he wanted to be a priest. And he was adamant, I want to be a priest. And so he got these other two guys to sort of side with him, and then another 250 guys, and between them they came against Moses, and they were like, you know what? Why can't we be priests? And what makes you any better than us? Like, God can speak to us. He don't just speak to you. And then you got this thing going on, this issue in their heart. They didn't want to stay where God wanted them. They wanted more, things that God never determined that they would have. So God don't play with that. If you know the story, God says to Moses, Moses, step aside. I I, got to do something because they're acting up. And even though it looks like they're rebelling against you, they're not. They're rebelling against me. And I don't take kindly to that. Moses, step aside. And the Bible describes this unique event. Maybe it's never happened again. I don't know. The Bible records it here. That the earth opened up. And all of those people, they went straight down to Sheol. And then the earth clears right up. God does not play with rebellion. Now, the other thing that happens, even as you read through that into the next chapter, is so many people were caught up in the rebellion that took place on that day, they were impacted by it. They started to think, you know what, maybe he was right, and you know what, maybe we all all could be priests. And this way, if you keep reading through that, you'll find that God sent a plague, and it took out more than 14,000 people. So not only did God deal decisively with Korah and those in the initial rebellion, But those that got caught up in it with the heart condition and decided that they were going to continue to grumble against God, God sent a plague and over 14,000 of them died as well. What Jude is bringing about is two things here. One, the heart of these false prophets is to, 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 to not want to stay where God has them, but to want more of things that God never said that they can have. They were never content. And then the other part of that is sometimes they have a huge following. A huge following. So when you look at TV and you look at this and you look at, don't think that the biggest church is God's church. Healthy things grow. I'm not saying that it isn't. I'm just saying that we have to be more discerning than, wow, a lot of people must be. God would say otherwise. This is the reference and the comparison that Jude is bringing about as he relates to these apostates and the rebellion that took place in Korah. There's 250. Everyone, you, you got to read that chapter. God does not take kindly to rebellion. When he opened up the earth, Korah, his family, the other two dudes and their families, the 250 guy, it was a lot of people that went straight on because God doesn't do well with rebellion. He will not tolerate it. He's God. He will not share his glory with anyone, and he will not tolerate rebellion. So this is what Jude wants this church to understand as it pertains to these three examples. And then it goes on in verse 12. These people are blemishes at your love feast. These apostates, they're blemishes at your love feast. Now, blemishes obviously is a a negative word, a word that uh, sort of indicates that what's there shouldn't be there is a blemish, it's a problem, it's a spot. But better translated is probably in, in, in King James Version or New King James or ESV, and this is what it says there. These people are hidden reefs at your love feast. Hidden reefs at your love feast. Now, in Bermuda, we have the unique awareness of what reefs are and how they can be detrimental to unsuspecting ships crossing without knowing that they're there. That's how Bermuda got formed. You got people exploring the world and so excited. Wow, that looks great. Let's go there. And before they get there, they get shipwrecked. And then the ship goes down and life's lost and it's a catastrophe. The idea here is in their love feast. So in the early church, there were a couple of things that were a normal thing that they would do. They would get together to consider God's word. That was preached, of course. Um, they would have the Lord's Supper. And then after that, they would have a love feast. Okay, that was a time. It was like a, a church potluck. Everyone brought food, and everyone would hang out and chill out and have a good time fellowshipping together. And as you know, when we fellowship like that, that's a time when, in a sense, our guards are down. You know, we're just sitting back. We're enjoying. You know, you eat a lot of food. Blood stops going to your head. You sit there. You know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. This is when these apostates would be at their best. They were hidden reefs. They were there looking for unsuspecting people who were just casually hanging out, feeling safe. But that's when they would pounce. 
Now, they weren't pounced by just grabbing up and grabbing stuff. No, they were pounced in their minds and start plotting. Oh, yeah, I, I see how I might be able to take advantage of that person. Or, oh, okay, yeah, all right, kill. Cool. I know, give them some extra turkey. I could get in there. That's how they were thinking. And that's what Jude is bringing about here. They were hidden reefs. You couldn't see the reefs. They were underneath the water. But when you hit a reef, you got a problem. And this is what these false teachers and these apostates were like. It says, eating with you without the slightest qualm, no conscience, no, 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 no heart to say, wow, that person's really in a bad state. Maybe I can help them, but not help them for them while helping them. I'll get something out of it. Mm -mm. They would just be there, not caring. You wouldn't see it. Hidden reefs, blemishes. But this is how they were thinking. No qualms. They would hang out and do it all, and everything was cool, but they were false apostates. Shepherds who feared Ernie themselves. Ernie had one concern, and that was feeding themselves. Verse 12 says this, They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. Again, Jude is hammering this thing. you got to know what these false prophets and these false teachers are like. He says they are like clouds without rain. Now, we had a lot of rain the last couple of days, and I am so thankful because my tank was needing some water. And the idea, and again, another unique situation for us to really grasp this. When you see clouds, the normal cycle of clouds, you see some clouds, the gray, the coming over, you are normally anticipating that there will be some rain. And you got to remember, Jude is right into an agri agri agrarial uh, context. So rain is all they had. That's the way they got their water. They didn't have no reverse osmosis and all that. So when they saw the rain coming, it was just like, I mean, the clouds coming, they were anticipating, yeah, 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 the rain's coming. But what Jude is saying here, these false teachers, they're like clouds without any rain. So you see the cloud. And in your mind, you're getting excited because you know you need some water. And then you see any cloud coming, you look, yeah, and then the cloud just keeps going, and, and then the cloud just, and, and it was no rain. No rain, no refreshing, no, 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 no watering, nothing to bring about growth. It might have looked good. It looked like a really fluffy cloud that, oh, man, I'm waiting. And then it just, wow, no rain, no rain. That's what Jude is saying that they're like. And then he goes on, he says, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. Autumn trees, this is the second harvest and the last harvest of the year. So same idea, you know, a farmer's been farming hard all year. They start plowing in fall for the next fall. It's like a year thing. And so they're waiting, waiting for this last harvest. They've done all their work. They prepared the soil and they're ready for it. And it's like, it's no fruit. There's no fruit, which means now they have to go through a whole winter of disappointment, which might set them back, might set their family back, might set their economics back, but there's no fruit. And then he says they're uprooted. In other words, it's as if these false teachers, they're not even rooted to the nutrient that would bring about the fruit in the first place. There's no fruit, but now I see why. They're uprooted. They may look like they're rooted, but there's no source. They're not getting anything, so they're not going to produce any fruit. So they're uprooted, twice dead. That's what Jude says there. Then we come to verse 13. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever. They are wild waves of the sea. Scripture often uses the sea as a symbol for those who do not know God. In Isaiah 57, verse 20, Isaiah 57, 20, it says this, but the wicked are like the tossing sea which cannot rest whose waves cast up mire and mud. In other words, there's a lot of activity, there's a lot of firming, and all of that stuff, but all that comes out is the debris and the mud and stuff. Like, that's it. That's it. So it, it looks like there's a lot of stuff happening, but the end result, once those waves then go back out, you look on the seashore and all you see is debris. All you see is stuff, shameful stuff, stuff that shouldn't have been. That's just how uh, these men operate. And then he says, wandering stars, for whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever. The idea here seems to imply that um, these wandering stars and the comparison is being made of sort of a shooting star. 
okay, a shooting star, so, or a meteor. So you're seeing it, and it's just like this bright light. Catches everyone's attention. It's like, oh, wow, wow, wow. But eventually it fades, and you won't see it again. That seems to be what Jude is bringing about here. It's a bright light. It's like everyone can see it, and you see it, and then it's, a, it's here for a while, and then eventually it's no longer. That's what he seems to be implying there. Wandering stars, of whom the blackest darkest has been uh, reserved forever. And then in verse 14 and 15, Jude sort of shifts and he says, listen, I'm telling you a lot about what you know, these uh, false teachers are like because you've got to be able to identify them. But again, sort of what we reflected on last week, don't think for a second that they won't be judged. So this is where he goes. Verse 14, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts they have done in an ungodly way and of all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. You think God was serious about the word ungodly in that verse? Never think, regardless of what you see, that anyone's going to get a pass. Okay, no one gets a pass. Not with God. Now, for the believer, you and I, those of us who know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, the standard still applies. But we have Jesus Christ as our advocate who keeps that standard perfectly on our behalf. That's the difference. For those who have just been defiant, never come to Christ in truth, doing their own thing, then the standard applies, but there's no advocate for them. And they will be judged. That's what Jude is teaching here. So there is no pass. There's no pass. That's why Jesus had to endure what he endured. He didn't get a pass either. It just so happens what he went through wasn't for his sin, but it was for ours. So Jude is making sure that even as he's trying to help us identify the characteristics of these teachers, that you understand no one gets a pass. They won't get a pass. Okay? And then we come to verse 16, and he jumps back into more... Um, description of those false teachers. He says, these people are grumblers and fault finders. They're grumblers and fault finders. This is the same word that, or the same idea that's used in the Old Testament of the Israelites when they would be grumbling about, about the way God was providing for them. You know, God would provide manna for them. No, but what I wouldn't meet. So God would provide quail. And then that was another issue. Now, either to laugh at that, but I like a lot of different foods, so I can't say I wouldn't have been murmuring. You know, manna every day, but that's not the point. The point is God was providing, and they weren't being thankful of it, and they were murmuring against God, and they were complaining. Similar thing happens with false teachers. They complain. They're never content. They always want this or always want that. Or what God's determined plan is, they would rather something different, something better, something bigger. That's just one of the characteristics that it brings about here. And then he goes on to say, they follow their own evil desire. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. They flatter others for their own advantage. The reason that we're going through Jude is the same reason that Jude sent this to that church so many years ago. The church is and will always be under attack. And you and I have to learn to contend for the faith. Part of that is identifying the false teachers and the apostates. Nothing doesn't mean that you have to call them up and blast them. If God leads you to do that, hey. But the point is, stay clear of them. Know what they're in it for. Know what their game is. Know how they go about doing their thing, and be careful. Don't just listen to everyone who just says they have a word for you. They flatter others for their own advantage. So they'll say the right thing. They'll say it at the right time. They'll say it in the right way. But they're only doing it for attention. That's what Jude is bringing about here, all right? So as we continue to understand how it is that we're to contend for the faith, God would have us first and foremost understand, as Jude wrote, how is it that we can identify, identify false teachers and apostates. So we're going to get ready to close, and I just want us to reflect on a couple things, okay? Let's just close our eyes. Let's close our eyes. Because I don't want this to be a message which is about everyone else and all the false teachers and all of that. That's true. But remember, Jude was in writing this, expecting that they would get on a boat and go somewhere or do this. He was writing it so that they would know who these false teachers were, 
so that they could contend for the faith, so that their own faith wouldn't have been shipwrecked. That's why he was writing it, and that's why we need to be um, understanding it as well. So three things I want to ask. If we could just come to our feet. Let's just stand real quick. The first thing I want us to pray, I'm just going to stand here, not going to call anyone for it, but the first thing that we're going to pray is, God, will you help me to have discernment, God? Help me to know who to listen to, help me know what to listen to, and help me to know what to reject and leave alone. Because every word is not for you. Every word does not come from God. The next thing I want us to pray is, God, will you help me to guard my speech? Help me not to be irreverent and act as if I own the universe and I get to speak to anybody or anything as if they belong to me or I have authority over them. Help me to guard my speech and help me, God, to let you be God. Just pray that. Just pray that. And the last thing I want us to pray is this. God, you've been teaching me to contend for the faith. Maybe I've been making some adjustments and I'm getting involved in the battle. Help me to recognize and understand who the real enemy is. Help me not to take it out on people. Help me not to get all crazy in conversations. But help me with a sincere heart to understand that the battle is against the devil and the demonic forces, not against people, but I need your help. I need your help. So go ahead and ask God for that help right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, let's lift our hands real quick. I'm just going to pray God's blessing, and then we will be dismissed. Father, we bless you. We honor you, God. We give you glory. You are God, and you always will be God. You are God, and you will share your glory with no one, God. And Father, I thank you, God, for what it is that you've been teaching us. And I pray, God, that you would help us to have discerning hearts based on your word. Help us to recognize your voice. Help us to recognize what you're saying by your spirit, God. And help us to test everything, God. Can't just run with stuff, God. Help us, God. So protect us. Protect our hearts, God. Protect our minds, God. And even as we continue to engage with this battle, God, and be content for the faith. Help us, God, to understand that the battle is yours alone and the battle is against the devil and the demonic world, God. It's not against people, God. People can be instruments in the devil's hands, God, but help us, God, to know the difference, God, and help us to engage in the right way, God. Bless us, I pray, God. Bring us back next week. In Jesus' name, amen. This message has been brought to you by Cornerstone Bible Fellowship Bermuda. To connect with us, visit us at www.cornerstone.bm or if you have a prayer request, email us at prayer at cornerstone.bm.